play that 16th note groove just straight. Go! You'll be amazed. Okay! just saw was raw, concentrated, creative energy, like this conference. In this case, collected, composed by a young Israeli named Kutiman, and just from videos from YouTube. Five years ago, I co-wrote a story about one small country, Israel, that was able to concentrate this kind of creative energy into more startups than anywhere outside of Silicon Valley. We called that story startup nation. But that's not the story I want to tell you today. I want to tell you about the unexpected plot twist that happened after the book came out. You know, we expected when the book came out that we'd, you know, deal with it with a couple months for a couple months and that would be the end of it. You know, really happy that it was a bestseller in the US. That's all we hoped for. But then something happened that we didn't imagine. It started getting translated. We're now actually, the languages keep coming. We're going to be 30 soon. And, uh, you know, it came out in Bulgarian and Chinese and Vietnamese, uh, French, Spanish, Italian, and so on. And I started following this book around the world. Actually, um, it didn't look much like that. It looked more like that. Um, but uh, one of the first places I got to was Colombia. And when people heard I was going to Colombia, the former uh, drug capital of the world, they, thought, they asked me, is that safe? And then I get there, and uh, they hear I'm from Israel. And the first question I get, wow, Israel, is that safe? <laughs> so, but actually, Colombia was not only safe, but innovative. Uh, there was a contest online for the top most innovative city in the world. And the, the finalists were New York, Tel Aviv, and Medellin, and Medellin won. And I saw why. Because, you know, Medellin, they took, they built architectural masterpieces in the middle of slums and connected them with a modern transportation system. And not only that, there were startups. Uh, you know, a piezoelectric uh, startup trying to get power from roads. Uh, another doing artificial skin for burn victims. You know, this, these were not mobile apps. These were tackling tough technical challenges. I also got to China. You know, uh, the Chinese edition came out actually before the Hebrew edition in Israel. And, um, you know, what I heard there is that they are convinced in a few years they're going to be the largest economy of the world. They have no doubt. But they also know that they want to become the leading economy. And for that to happen, they have to move from made in China to made by China. So in Kenya, I met this young man named Solomon. He's a Maasai tribesman. He lived about three hours' walk from where I was. Um, he uh, didn't have uh, electricity or a bank account or a credit card. He'd never actually been to Nairobi. But he had a cell phone. And he had coverage, no problem, where we were. And he could do things that I couldn't do in Israel with my iPhone. He had mobile payments. He could buy stuff. He could you know, uh, send money to his family uh, on the street. Uh, basically, what Tim Cook announced in, in, you know, with the iPhone 6, he's been doing for years in Kenya with text messages. So what this showed me is that clearly uh, that countries like Kenya can leapfrog whole levels of, of, of technology. They can go straight from landlines to cell phones. They can maybe skip roads and power plants. And, and you know, this is a great opportunity for innovation. And they also understand that they don't have to first develop and then 
do innovation like the rich countries did. They can actually do both at the same time. So then I got my first email from Mongolia. Uh, it was from a young woman named uh, Zolnomar in Ulaanbaatar. And she wrote, you know, we, uh, we don't want to sell your book. We just want to give it away. We just want more Mongolians to read it. We want to have a culture of innovation in Mongolia. We want to be a startup nation. You know, this was mind-boggling to me. You know, Israel could not be much further from Mongolia in distance and culture and language and whatever you think. And yet, somehow, Israel seemed to be a good model for Mongolia. So just, but just to see this, not just about developing countries. You know, I just got back from Japan, you know, very rich country, uh, lots of huge companies. But you know, in Japan, they're the rapidly, most rapidly aging company, country in the world. And they're shrinking. Their population is shrinking. And they're thinking, we've got to recapture our legacy of innovation. We need startups. So what did I learn on my endless book tour? Uh, wandering around the world, um, a few things. One is that every country wants startups. These are just some of the logos of uh, startup promotion organizations, mostly created by governments around the world. You know, governments are spending billions on promoting innovation, and they see startups as central to that after effort. Startups are coming up everywhere. You know, this is a, a map produced by Startup Genome. When you drill down to it, it's got 80,000 uh, startups on it in 52 countries. So this is a global phenomenon. Um, this is probably one of the most critical things, is that every country has its own story. Now, I realize this, you know, everywhere, but um, you know, think of Israel's story. Our story was about overcoming adversity. We're a tiny country with no resources in a bad neighborhood. You know, the United States has almost opposite circumstances. This is a huge country, lots of resources, Canada. And yet the United States produced Silicon Valley, and Israel produced startup nations. So clearly we had very, very different paths to innovation. And what this showed me is that every country has its own path based on its own history, its own culture, its own geography, and most of all, its own strengths. Now, this is a bit of a problem because we're blind to our own strengths. This is a strange thing. For instance, when I was in Spain, as like many countries I've been to, they complain about how we're not entrepreneurial, we don't like to take risks, you know, the government's doing all the wrong things. And then I get back to Israel, and uh, I live in Jerusalem, and I, to get into Jerusalem, you drive under that bridge. It's designed by Calatrava, the Spanish architect. And my teenage daughters shop in big Spanish brands like Zara and Mango. And in Israel, we complain, why do we only do startups? Why can't we do big companies? And you know, so I, just as in Spain, they say, you know, oh, big companies, that's easy. Why can't we do startups? So everybody's focused on what's difficult for them. And that's a problem because we're going to build our innovation sector on our own strength. And if we take from, for granted, how are we going to do that? The other thing is that every country is going through the same sort of three stages. First, uh, you've got startups and no venture capital. Second, you've got the first high profile success stories. Third, you start getting kind of momentum and, uh, and you start attracting capital and talent. So what do these first high profile success stories look like that everybody's trying to get? You know, for example, Skype in Estonia, uh, Angry Birds in Finland. You know, for Israel, a, a watershed one was ICQ, this chat program that was bought by AOL for $400 million in the late 90s, you know, when it had no revenue. It was started by a few 20-year-olds, and Israelis saw this, and they said, oh my god, if, if, if these idiots can do it, I can do it. So this was a tremendous boost for entrepreneurship in Israel, but it also sent the signal globally there's something going on in Israel you better check out. And this is, it basically put us on the map of innovation. And that's what these high profile success stories do, that every country is trying to hit that watershed. 
So how do we make it happen? One great idea is actually, uh, this is Tokyo, but here in London, you've got uh, startups coming out in an area that's now called Silicon Roundabout, not the nicest part of town, but it's, uh, it's actually where startups like to be. There's creative energy, the rents are, are cheap. And uh, instead of building just another tech park, what the UK decided to do is just draw a circle around this and call it Tech City. You know, I know people sometimes say uh, Tech City is it really doing anything, but I thought it was a brilliant move to say, here's where the startups are. Just kind of shine a light on what's happening organically. And when I was in Tokyo, I told them they should do the same thing in this area of Tokyo. So another huge thing that governments can do is talk to the entrepreneurs. Ask them, how are we making your lives miserable? And stop doing those things. Remove those obstacles. You know, I think we heard this before, that one of the most important things that governments can do is not throw money, but actually stop doing things that are causing a problem that cost nothing to do that. Um, governments have something that's also that, that's critical uh, for startups, and that is data. They have tons of data, and, but they're very bad at releasing it. Um, if you release that data, you're going to get more startups and you're going to get better government. And the other thing is that startups actually spend money on IT and all these things, but they buy only from the big companies. What if you started buying from startups? And here, too, I think the UK is setting an example with uh, gov.uk, uh, both in opening the data and in radically opening their supply chain. And, and what's great is it's open source. So I've been encouraging the Israelis to just simply take this from the UK, and I hope a lot of countries do that. Um, but probably the most important, basic, untapped opportunity is don't do it alone. We've got to build startups across countries. Now, I'll just give a couple quick examples. Uh, a friend of mine named uh, Greg Roxon is from Ghana. Uh, he has an idea called M Pharma. It's uh, letting doctors write digital prescriptions. Don't you wish you didn't have to pick up a prescription and just take your phone to the pharmacy? We don't have that in Israel. But he's rolling this out in three African countries now. And, but he's building the startup in Ghana and in Israel. This is a Ghanaian Israeli startup. And he's building on the strength of both countries. And that's, I think, phenomenal. Another is um, an Israeli company uh, started by a few guys who, who like to play games and realize that you can teach all kinds of things they don't learn in school through games, like strategic thinking, decision making, and so on. It's a great idea going nowhere because they had no idea how to get actually into any market. And a Brazilian found them and said, wow, this is great. I want to take it to Brazil. And now there are a million kids using this in Brazil. And this is a, going to be a global company. And it's a Brazilian Israeli company that neither side could have done alone. I was uh, in Croatia recently and met a, a guy, Martin Birak, who started a company called Monolith. He'd done a number of startups, but this one had founders from Netherlands, Estonia, and Croatia. And he was convinced that this one was working because of that. And by the way, I met earlier one of the founders of Skype, seven founders from Sweden, Denmark, the United States, and Estonia. Uh, and that's a pretty successful company. So how do we combine our strengths? How do we do this? Um, we need to build teams across countries. If we do that, we're going to get those big success stories faster, and we're going to reach critical mass with our ecosystems faster. So it's easy to say that, but how do we begin? Because you know, it's really difficult to um, overcome cultural barriers, language barriers, distance barriers. You know, there's a reason why we don't do this more often, cooperating across countries, building startups across countries. But I want to quote, actually, not just to understand this, uh, not from Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, but Bill Withers. Because I think he actually explains best um, the real barrier, which is psychological. It's the idea that we have to do everything ourselves. This is our really biggest obstacle. So I want you to listen very closely to the words. 
Please, let's swallow our pride. Let's combine our strengths. Let's pool them and build amazing things together. Thank you. <laughs>